Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another Deathbed Confessions video. I filmed something just like this one a couple of months ago and it did really well. I've really gotten into doing this occasional listicle style video because they're a really great way to talk about cases that usually wouldn't have enough information to make into a full video or just to focus in on one element. When I did the last one I said I had more cases on my list to talk about if people were interested and they were apparently so here we are with part 2. If you haven't seen my first video on this topic I will link it down below and on the screen so you can go and watch it after this one if you're interested. But firstly before we really get into the stories here I want to share with you the sponsor of this video, Invisaware, the jewellery that could save your life. I have worked with Invisaware before last year and I got great feedback from you guys as well as just myself absolutely loving what the company does and what they stand for so I'm really really happy to be working with them again. Did you know that statistics show that nearly one in every five women gets attacked at some point in her lifetime? I luckily haven't yet fallen under that statistic but I can't tell you the amount of times I've been walking alone both day and night and I've started to get that feeling that I'm being followed or had guys come and sit next to me and stare on public transport even though there's plenty of other seats available or someone just being creepy and too hands on on a night out. Horribly, I don't think any of those are unusual circumstances for any women and even some men to find themselves in and I'm one of the lucky ones, it's never been anything worse than that. Even with smartphones and the technology we have nowadays, in a stressful situation when you're actually being attacked or feel like you're about to be, you're probably not going to have time to be able to call for help and that's a problem that Invisaware is on a mission to fix. Invisaware is a safety accessory coming in the form of bracelets, necklaces, keychains, fitness bands, even scrunchies that when pressed can send an SOS alert up to five loved ones of your choice along with your exact GPS location and it can optionally call the emergency services for you if you enable that feature although that is only available in the US at the moment. Invisaware pairs with an app on your smartphone via low energy Bluetooth on which you can add your personal profile, sort of any information about yourself that would be relevant to share with the police in case of an emergency. Invisaware products aren't obviously safety accessories, a predator won't know that the necklace or whatever it is you're wearing is anything other than a pretty piece of jewellery. I have both a key ring and this beautiful gold necklace. I love it and it goes with so many of my outfits. It's something I can easily wear if I know I'm potentially going into a situation where I could be at risk. There's no monthly fees or subscriptions to use this product, it's literally just the one-off product price. Although there is an optional premium subscription for which Invisaware has collaborated with the security company ADT if you just want that extra layer of safety. One of my biggest concerns was accidentally pressing the button and sending an alert to my loved ones and panicking them but don't worry you're actually very unlikely to do that. You've got to rapidly double press the button which is on the back of this necklace here to initiate the alert and you're very unlikely to do that and all of the charms are sweat and rain resistant. You don't need to remember to charge it, the battery is very long lasting, it lasts one to two years depending on usage, and the app will warn you when the battery is running low as well, as well as sending reminders every so often just to check that everything is still in working order. This is a company I really, really believe in. I think it's something that can make a huge difference and it already has. Invisaware has already been responsible for saving so many people in bad situations and I just want to shout about the company from the rooftops. So there will be a link in the description box down below for anyone who wants to go and check the website out. I highly, highly recommend you do. I was just in the middle of editing this video as you can see and I realised I completely forgot to mention that I'm actually hosting a giveaway with Invisaware over on my Instagram page. It's at georgiamarie underscore x so if you'd like a chance at winning your very own Invisaware product then head over there and see how you can join in. And with that let's get back into talking about some deathbed confessions. First up we have the story of a man called Naaman Diller art theft and the mystery of Marie Antoinette's watch. 
This one begins in 1983 in Jerusalem, Israel, when 106 timepieces, paintings and artefacts were stolen from the LA May Museum for Islamic Art. According to an article on Wired, this museum was famous for its collection of both Islamic artefacts as well as a number of rare and unusual watches. The watches had nothing to do with Islam, of course, but they were simply displayed in the museum because they'd once belonged to the father of the museum's founder. This was said to be the most costly theft in Israeli history, with one item of many being a pocket watch that once belonged to French Queen Marie Antoinette. I have also done a video on her in the past for anyone interested. Her story is not what you think it was. It's really interesting. The watch alone, which is often nicknamed as the Queen, was said to be valued at 19 million pounds, so about 30 million dollars, and is one of the most complex watches ever made. Commissioned in 1783, and rumour even says that Marie carried it up to the gallows with her. Some call it the Mona Lisa of watches. It was the 15th of April 1983 when a thief broke into the museum in the middle of the night, somehow aware that at the time the museum's alarm system just happened to be broken. It seems the thief just turned up in his car, used a hydraulic jack to crank open some metal bars just enough that he could squeeze through, and then used a rope ladder and hooks to climb 10 feet up the side of the building and squeezed through an 18 inch tall window that he'd opened with a screwdriver. This was a daring heist, it's the kind of thing that you only see in movies, and yet somebody had been able to pull it off, on his own no less. The only clue they had to his identity was that he must have been very thin to fit through this window. Moving 106 items can't have been a quick job, so the thief would have been there for quite a while, yet somehow not a single guard was ever alerted to his presence. In the aftermath, museum owners hired their own private investigator to find these pieces. It was a former Israeli army intelligence officer who was known for his success, who would usually start interrogating his suspects in a circle until someone broke. But that couldn't happen here because there weren't any strong suspects in the case at all. This private investigator checked auction houses, kept tabs on antique dealers and collectors. He would chase watches around the world to see if any of them happened to be one of the missing 106 pieces, but there was never any luck. It was clear that not only whoever did this was incredibly brave and skilled enough to carry off the heist in the first place, but they were also very careful about selling the pieces in the aftermath. Most of the stolen watches were way too well known to just sell on the open market, and anyone who would know the value of these pieces would have heard about the burglary in the first place. There was certainly no chance a watch like Marie Antoinette's could be sold on the open market without people being alerted to it, so it seemed that this watch was just never sold by the thief, so why did he do it? Eventually, the PI just had to move on. It was clear this case wasn't ever going to get solved, every lead led to a dead end, and the museum just slowly recovered from the loss, thanks to a very hefty insurance payout, no less. This would remain unsolved for two decades, and nobody expected that one day it would get solved, but it did. The perpetrator, it would turn out, was a man called Naaman Diller. According to a couple of sources, he was actually a known criminal in Israel and was considered a suspect at the time of the theft. But when documents showed that he was out of the country at the time, documents that of course had been forged, investigators just moved on to the next. Investigators also thought that this would have been carried out at the time by a gang, not by a lone man. So they never really came back around to him as a suspect until after his death. According to an article on FT.com, Diller was a fighter pilot with the Israeli army, but was thrown out on his last flight before finally qualifying when he decided to sweep over his kibbutz, which according to Google is a cooperative Israeli farming community. Diller was said to be a very talented and very intelligent man, but he funneled this skill wrongly into crime, and he committed a series of infamous thefts throughout the 60s and 70s. In 1970, Naaman Diller met a woman called Nili Shamrat, 
but they lost contact a couple of years later when he was sent to prison and she travelled to the US to study. At some point over the next few years, the two reunited. Dilla, it seems, fled to Europe for a bit before returning to Israel, but ended up marrying Lily in Jerusalem in 2003 after being in a very long-term, long-distance relationship. He'd recently been diagnosed with cancer, it seems, so they wanted to make things official. Neely would return to the USA not long after the wedding to work. She was a Hebrew teacher in a Los Angeles school, but they kept in contact via phone. But Dilla would end up dying of said cancer the very next year. The first and only big break in this case came around 2006, it seems, according to the Los Angeles Times, when the LA May Museum informed investigators that it had just paid around $40,000 to an anonymous American woman to buy back 40 of the stolen items, including the Marie Antoinette piece. They'd been able to negotiate the sale down from $2 million to just 40000 so to me it seems like somebody just wanted these pieces off their hands. Forensic experts were allowed to examine the clocks and watches, and detectives interviewed the lawyer who negotiated this sale, and this eventually led them to none other than Neely Shamrat, who was soon identified as being the widow of Naaman Dilla. When they arrived at her house to question her, they found even more of the missing clocks and timepieces, and paper trails eventually led investigators to storage units and safety deposit boxes in France, the Netherlands and Israel, where they found even more of the pieces. Over all the years he had them, Dilla hadn't been able to do much with any of the pieces although maybe that was by design. Meticulous notes by him were later found which showed that he wrote in depth about each component and mechanism of the watches, and he wrote this on whatever paper he could find, including toilet paper and old boxes, so he was clearly fascinated by them. If he really wanted the money, he could have easily taken the watches apart and sold them for pieces and made a good amount of money that way, but he never did. One of the investigators who broke this case would later say of Dilla's crimes in Israel as a whole, he was a legendary robber. He was very different, very intelligent, and had a unique style. We were all disappointed that we didn't have the chance to sit and talk to him and investigate him. We feel like we missed out on that. Dilla always managed to stay one step ahead of law enforcement, and he was kind of, in a way, admired by them. The techniques he used in his crimes were something that they just never seen before, and it was clear that he just loved the thrill of the heist rather than any money he could make from them. Soon, the mystery completely unraveled. After three days of questioning, Neely admitted that her husband had told her his secret on his deathbed, that he'd been the one responsible for the infamous museum burglary. As I mentioned, it seems he died of cancer, so he probably knew that he was ill slash dying for quite a while, and decided it was time to share some secrets. Sources differ as to when he exactly told his wife, whether it was a year before or literally on his deathbed, but not long before his death, Neely came to visit her husband one last time, and together they put some of the stolen pieces in a safety deposit box. Although sources are a bit iffy, it seems investigators may have later found some pieces in the house and some in the safety deposit box, or maybe they were all in the box. It's a little bit funny. But after her husband's death, Neely attempted to sell the pieces back to the museum anonymously. Perhaps she felt like they needed to be back where they belonged, perhaps she saw it as a way to get them off her conscience, but chances are, had she not done anything, investigators never would have found the pieces until way after her death. But of course, what she did was criminal in itself, and she was actually eventually convicted and sentenced to five years probation and 300 hours of community service for her part in the sale. She lost her teaching job in the USA as a result, and she essentially got punished for her husband's crimes, who evaded everything with his death. Would it have simply been kinder for him to just never tell his wife what he'd done? To just hide away the collection himself, she could have declared innocent if anyone ever came to ask, if they ever even did. Her lawyer describes Neely as a misguided victim. 
So far, 96 of the 106 stolen items have been recovered and returned to the museum, where the collection is now displayed in a vault on the ground floor, this time with no windows and a very elaborate surveillance system. Maybe they'll find the rest, or maybe they were taken to pieces and sold. For our next deathbed confession, we're actually headed to Norway, more specifically a city called Trondheim in central Norway, where two women were murdered under very similar circumstances in the 1970s. Sigrid Hegheim was found murdered in September 1976. She had been strangled and evidence showed that an attempt had been made to rape her. Just over a year later, on October 4th, 1977, a 36-year-old woman called Torin Finstad also went missing and a couple of days later her body was found. As you know, I usually like to provide more information about the victims, even in these listicle style videos. However, as the majority of information about this case is in Norwegian and I don't speak the language, there's sadly little more detail I could find about them. The day after Turun's body was found, a man called Fritz Moen was arrested on suspicion of only that murder. I can't be sure of why he came to the attention of the authorities in the first place, but it was clear from very early on that investigators weren't looking at anyone else. They were pretty convinced that they had the right man. He told police that he had an alibi, but he'd been at a friend's birthday party on the night that Turun had disappeared. And when they checked, witnesses did confirm that he was indeed at this party until the early hours of the morning. But undeterred, investigators continued to question Moen intensely. Over the next few weeks, he would give a number of varying accounts of his movements that night and gave conflicting statements, sometimes denying the crime to only in the very next sentence admit his guilt. Years later, it would become clear that anything Moen said in his confessions was public information. He said nothing that wouldn't have already been reported in the newspapers, or things that he wouldn't have just known from living in the general area. But something that's very important to know about Fritz Moen is that he was deaf, and he had quite a severe speech impediment as a result. He was of normal intelligence, but did require an interpreter to communicate with the police, which was just another thing to lead to possible misunderstandings and miscommunication. He was also disabled, his right arm was partially paralysed, but the disability wasn't deemed severe enough to have stopped him from committing the crime apparently, which was strangulation no less, for which you usually need both arms. Regardless, he was convicted and sentenced to 20 years imprisonment, with up to 10 years of post-release supervision. He appealed, of course, and the conviction was just upheld, although it was reduced down to 16 years. Moen always protested his innocence, but the authorities weren't quite done with him yet. He began to be subject to repeated questioning about the still unsolved murder of 20-year-old Sigrid Hegheim. Investigators would later claim that Moen confessed to this murder during his seventh interrogation, which just so happened to be the only interrogation where he didn't have an interpreter available. Moen recanted everything he said, claiming it was a product of confusion and coercion, but regardless, he was charged. The trial for the murder of Sigrid Hegheim took place in December 1981, and honestly, it all seemed like a bit of a farce to me. Whoever had killed Sigrid had type A blood, and Moen just didn't. But the prosecution speculated that because there was also E. coli bacteria present, that influenced a false test result. They picked apart his alibi, and eventually he was convicted on a second murder charge, and was sentenced to five years imprisonment to be served consecutively with his existing 16-year sentence. Moen's attorney said, for the first time at this desk, I allow myself to say that a travesty of justice has been committed. He ended up serving his entire sentence and was eventually released in March 1996 after 18 years of imprisonment. But of course, even then he was placed under supervision, which even got extended because a judge declared him as a threat. Moen never once stopped protesting his innocence, and eventually a private investigator got involved in his case, agreeing to work pro bono. 
Despite the private investigator's work though, and lots of talk of the case getting reopened, it was just dismissed and nothing more came of it until around 2003, when the appeals committee made a big announcement. The semen I previously mentioned that was found on Sigrid's body had been subject to a lot of discussion and analysis over the years. For a while it was thought that the semen may not have even belonged to the assailant, but instead to Sigrid's boyfriend, but eventually it was concluded that this could not have been possible. And so, in October 2003, the appeals committee announced that there were strong indications that the biological material could not come from anyone other than the perpetrator. And as we've already established due to blood types, it was not possible that this semen belonged to Moen. The case was finally going to be reopened and on the 7th of October 2004, he was finally acquitted of the murder and attempted rape of Sigrid Hegheim. However, his conviction for the rape and murder of Torun Finstad still stood though, which just days later he petitioned to also be reopened. But as things set in motion for this, Fritz Moen sadly died on the 28th of March 2005. But that wasn't to be the end of this case. Shortly before Christmas 2005, the media reported that a 67-year-old man in Trondlag County called Tor Hepso had confessed to both the murders of Sigrid Hegheim and to Run Finstad. He'd died on the 20th of December 2005, but not before reportedly confessing to three nurses on the 18th of December that he'd murdered two women. The nurses contacted both the priest and the local police and the next day Hepso repeated his confession to all. He said that he'd murdered two women in Trondheim in the 1970s, mentioning the names of both Sigrid and Turan. He even mentioned how Fritz Moen had been convicted of his crime. He couldn't give many details as he was apparently drunk when he committed both crimes and he died sooner than they thought he would, I suppose, because his statements weren't recorded or transcribed. However, seven different people were witness to his confessions, which is enough. And so, a thorough investigation was kicked off. Investigators discovered that Hepso had lived in Trondheim in 1976 and 1977, and through employment records, it's thought that he was indeed in the city on the day of each murder. He was a heavy drinker and had been plagued with mental illness throughout his adult life, as well as being hospitalised for mental illness before and after the murders. In 1979, he was admitted to a psychiatric hospital after he had a mental breakdown whilst working on an oil platform in the North Sea. In the 80s, it was reported by a girlfriend to the police that he was an extremely violent man, even attempting to strangle her on several occasions, as well as sexually assaulting her. She said he'd even threatened to kill her. The more investigators learned about this man's past, the more it made sense that he really could have been the one to commit these murders. As this was going on, Moen's appeal was still going through the motions. Despite his death, things like this don't just stop, and his family were determined to see it through to the end. Eventually, the petition was reopened on the grounds of concluding that the new evidence and circumstances which exist in this case in connection with Tor Hepso's confessions on 18th and 19th of December 2005, together with the remaining evidence in this case, are likely to lead to the acquittal of Fritz Moen for the murder of Turan Finstad in 1977. Just two months later, the Court of Appeal posthumously acquitted Moen of Torrens rape and murder, and it was said to be one of Norway's most shameful miscarriages of justice. And there was a big investigation into why this was allowed to happen in the first place. Although obviously Tor Hepso will never be able to be officially charged or go through trial, it's widely regarded that he was the true culprit of these crimes. The third confession I want to share with you today was technically a deathbed confession, until the person in question didn't end up dying. In 1977, a man called James Brewer was arrested in Tennessee on suspicion of shooting and killing his neighbour in a fit of jealous rage. He was apparently convinced that his neighbour, Jimmy Carroll, was flirting or maybe even having a relationship with his wife, Dorothy, and apparently James Brewer just couldn't handle those emotions. 
Records from the time state that at 4pm on the 27th of April 1977, Jimmy Carroll was shot twice by James Brewer, once in the abdomen and once below the left shoulder with a handgun. And then Brewer just drove off, leaving Jimmy bleeding to death outside of a petrol station. Jimmy tried to walk back into the shop for help, but he fell and died at the scene. Dorothy was apparently in the car with Brewer at the time of the shooting. There had long been rumours going around that Brewer had wanted to kill Jimmy, but Jimmy apparently never took the threat seriously until it had already happened. He was a divorced father of twin five-year-old boys who never got to know their dad. As I said, Brewer was arrested for this crime at the time, but was released on bail at $7,000 as he was thought to be a respectable member of the community. Turns out he wasn't, and him and his wife soon flee the town to start a whole new life together, even giving themselves new names. They became Michael and Dorothy Anderson. It was pretty easy to change your name and get a new social security number in 1977, as it turns out. According to the Daily Record, they first headed to Nashville, then Texas, and then eventually settled down in Shawnee, Oklahoma. Once in Oklahoma, they lived law-abiding lives. They became active members of the local church where Dorothy, or Dottie as she was sometimes known, even established her own Bible study group. She was a homemaker whilst Brewer worked in a local manufacturing plant until around 2006, it seems. They had a daughter, they became grandparents, and nobody ever thought this lovely couple could have ever been involved in anything untoward. The landlord testified that they paid their monthly rent like clockwork, and they were a fine family. That was until 2009, when James slash Michael had a serious stroke. He was dying and had to confess to the murder, which had clearly been weighing on his mind for the past 32 years. Reports say that Dorothy called the police whilst her husband was in his hospital bed, who soon came to his bedside. Police detective Tony Grasso later said to the Oklahoman that he wanted to cleanse his soul because he thought he was going to the great beyond. As James was interviewed at his hospital bed, Dorothy attempted to translate as the stroke had given him some trouble communicating. He slurred his words and couldn't quite grasp what he was trying to say. So part way through the confession, it was decided that they needed an attorney present. Brewer said enough at his deathbed for the officer to get the grasp of what he was trying to say, but he stopped short of actually saying the words, I killed Jimmy Carroll. So the officer photographed and fingerprinted Brewer before contacting the relevant authorities in Tennessee. James Brewer just wanted to clear his conscience before his death. I don't think he expected that he would actually survive the ordeal, having already suffered another stroke three years beforehand. But he does recover, or at least recovers enough to leave hospital. He ends up selling all of the family's belongings in a garage sale in Shawnee before surrendering to authorities in his former hometown of Hohenwald in Tennessee, and he appeared in court the following Monday with the same lawyer he'd had almost 32 years before. Not making the same mistake as last time, he was held in lieu of bail until a hearing decided on a $150,000 bond, which was likely too expensive for his family to afford. At the time though, Brewer was still pretty ill and he was being held in the county jail, where obviously medical care couldn't have been that great. He was still being fed through a feeding tube. Despite this, there were actually rumours that the prosecution was seeking the death penalty for him. In January 2010, Dorothy was also charged with being an accessory to murder after the fact, for the crime of leaving Tennessee. She was originally charged back in 1977 as well, I assume for being at the scene and being complicit, but a grand jury failed to indict her at the time. And as much as it completely pains me to end this segment this way, I couldn't find a single online article about this case dated after March 2010. As Brewer's trial was meant to start in November 2010, for the life of me, I couldn't find any resolution for this story. I literally scrolled search engines for hours, but nothing. I'm so sorry, but hey, I suppose we're all used to unsolved mysteries on this channel. We can probably assume that they were both convicted, though.
The final confession of this video has to do with a woman called Geraldine DiMarzio Kelly, who died of breast cancer in Massachusetts on the 12th of November 2004, aged 54. For over a decade, Geraldine had told her children and anyone else who asked that her husband and their father, John Kelly, had been killed in a car accident, saying that he'd taken off in his car and the last she'd heard, he'd had an accident, he'd been hit by a truck or something. The location and details of said car crash would change with each version of the story. When the children asked where their father was buried, she was never able to give them a straight answer with a friend saying that once Geraldine said to her, I don't know why they were all concerned because John never cared, he never loved them, as reported by the Sioux City Journal. At the time, Geraldine worked at a California motel and told co-workers a number of different stories about his death, but all versions of the story focused around some form of car accident. But just before her death in Massachusetts, Geraldine confessed to her daughter, Sherry Ann, that she knew exactly where John was. She had killed him 13 years beforehand when the family still lived in Ventura, California, apparently after years of abuse. Sources are a little bit iffy on whether it is 13 or 14 years before her death, but it definitely seems to have been around the early 90s for sure. The motivation behind Geraldine finally confessing to her daughter aren't entirely clear. We don't know whether she just wanted to get it off her chest before she died, or if she wanted to make sure that there were no repercussions for her children when they went to clear through her belongings and came across his body. Because that's right, not only had she killed her husband, but she also kept his body. Following the confession of the murder and her mother's death, Sherry Ann contacted the authorities who started to investigate the case. I honestly wasn't too sure if Geraldine just confessed to the murder or to the fact that she still actually had his body, but I will assume the latter because it wasn't long until police had a warrant to search Geraldine's home and her lot at Planet Self Storage in Somerville, Massachusetts. There, investigators found a freezer sealed with duct tape and inside a decomposed corpse. Obviously, they were unable to identify the corpse as John Kelly just by sight, but the coroner was able to identify the body based on his size. He was five foot six and 135 pounds and had three pretty distinctive tattoos. John Kelly hadn't been killed by a car accident, but with a single gunshot wound to the back of his head for being unceremoniously thrown in the freezer by his wife. Perhaps the most shocking part of this story is that, as we've already covered, John was killed when he lived in California, but the body was discovered the other side of the country in Massachusetts. When Geraldine moved, she also moved the body and no one ever noticed a thing. She had paid a company called Allied Van Lines to move her belongings across the country and the driver would later recall moving a freezer sealed with duct tape in late October 1998. He said he didn't notice anything unusual nor detect any smell from the freezer, so he had no reason to suspect anything untoward. Shockingly, the freezer was still in its cardboard box when it was found. It had never been plugged in and the corpse wasn't frozen as you would expect. The authorities actually described the corpse as essentially mummified. They soon found the gun in question in Geraldine's apartment. Her husband had been killed with a 38 caliber bullet and the gun matched that. There didn't seem to be any financial motive behind this murder, there was no insurance payout as far as the authorities could find, no money claimed, so that wasn't the motive here. You're probably wondering how people didn't ask more questions when John just disappeared one day, but it seems that a lot of answers can be found in the family dynamics here. The main reason it seems that no one really questioned where John went is that the couple were actually originally from Somerville, Massachusetts, where Geraldine would later die. At a family wedding in 1981, a fight broke out and John's brother-in-law was fatally injured. John and three other men were charged for the fight with assault and battery, although never on any murder charges, although John wasn't going to stick around to find out. John and Geraldine were now married high school sweethearts and they decided they needed to flee the state and so they head to California, but the two would not have a happy marriage. 
John Kelly was said to be a quiet man who at one point was in the army. In Somerville he'd owned a auto repair shop and he was at some point a foreman at a steel manufacturing plant and after the move to California he worked as a handyman slash repairman at the same motel Geraldine worked at. They both actually lived in an apartment at the motel, it was just this $50 a night motel besides the freeway in Ventura north of Los Angeles. John was described as quiet until he drank, at which point he would become very violent, hence the fight at the wedding in the first place. After that point in his life he started to become very secretive and although no one outside of the family ever knew of any domestic violence between John and Geraldine, it doesn't seem that people were all that shocked by the possibility. By the late 80s the couple were actually estranged from their children and the children would later say that the violence between the two of them was the main reason why they distanced themselves, hence why they never really asked too many questions about their father's whereabouts. And obviously John was also estranged from his family after the wedding fight so they also never really asked. It also seems that in 1989 John was convicted of driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs so the idea that he'd get in a car crash wasn't all that crazy. Geraldine wasn't the most likeable person either it seems, with people who used to work with her saying that she had a very nasty personality and she cussed like a truck driver. I don't think swearing necessarily makes somebody a bad person but Geraldine just didn't seem like she was very well liked in general. She was the kind of person who always spoke her mind and she had a pet Rottweiler and a snake. She had this bow constrictor that she would wear around her shoulders purposefully to scare guests at the motel. But apparently she was good at her job, she was a good manager. It just seems like two bad people who got into a bad relationship. It shouldn't have ended the way it did but with the violence surrounding their relationship it doesn't seem like anyone on the inside was all too surprised. Although of course their children were traumatised by what happened, as you would be. This deathbed confession was a pretty open and shut case. The confession itself combined with the body being discovered in the storage unit, the gunshot wound and said gun being found, there was no reason to assume the situation here was anything other than what Geraldine confessed to. So there you go, four more deathbed confessions to ponder over. If you know of any other deathbed confessions, either in your life or just ones you've heard of, please share them in the comments down below if you'd like to. I find it really interesting how people feel inclined to share secrets on their deathbeds. Do they know something at that point that we don't know about confessing your sins? Or do they just not think about the repercussions and trauma put on the loved ones after the fact? Is it intended to help? Is it a panic response in your final moments? I'd actually really love to look further into the psychology behind them but I suppose nobody really knows. You would think that more cases would be solved this way because when you're about to die you've got nothing more to lose but why would you want to make yourself look bad after your death? Why not continue to get away with your crime? I don't know, it just fascinates me. Thank you so much for tuning in this week, please don't forget to go and check out Invisaware in the description box down below. I'm a huge fan of this company, I think they're doing amazing things and I think they can really help save lives. And I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.